Welcome to Blighty Day Fiance, Blight of the Living Dead. Yes. My name is Michelle. My name is Robin Hallow. This is a one off recap of the series finale of what used to be one of the greatest TV shows of all time. We are here because I lost a bet. We normally cover <laughs> reality shows. We're uh, we're dipping our toe in the deep end of uh, fiction and drama. Yep, however, dipping our toe in, and there's a zombie eye socket underneath. Yeah, there sure is. Yeah, that was not a nice beach. No, it wasn't. <laughs> oh boy. Um, it was a little bit like Fire Festival. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> oh my god! <sighs> you know, like with Game of Thrones, so it's like, oh, look at this beautiful location in Croatia, and like the tourism goes up. Do you think Zombie Skull Beach is going to be like the hip in place for all of the uh, the hipsters to go? No, probably not. No. All right. Um, here we are doing this. We usually do reality TV. Um, the occasional detour into scripted. We, we're doing The Crown. Some of those pods will be dropping our hope this week. Um, and various other things. But yeah, Michelle said that um, fewer than five of our listeners, the, the many millions of our listeners, um, would have ever watched The Walking Dead and couldn't believe there'd be any crossover at all and was roundly proven wrong. Yes, I was. Um, and lost the bet. So we are here. I'm delighted to be here. I have a love-hate relationship with The Walking Dead in so far as I have watched it um, all the way through. Um, I got five seasons into Fear and then, oh boy, um, didn't watch any of The World Beyond, beyond one episode, I think. Um, but I'm very much one of those kind of, uh, if I start something, I can't quit it kind of guys. Um, very few shows uh, get abandoned halfway through. Um but yeah, like everyone else, I think we all know what happened with this particular show. It 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 didn't really stay true. I think it came back a little bit uh, in the latest regime under Angela Kang, um, a little bit. But even then, I think it probably drifted. But hey, but hey, um, it's a sentimental moment, right? Yeah, I'm trying to think of, and, and I consider myself a television connoisseur. It is... Um, I, I'm a huge fan of other art forms as well, but it's probably the one that I find the most impactful. I was very lucky to sort of come of age during what's widely regarded as the golden age of television, even though I would say that the you know, there's lots of golden ages. There's waves of excellent television across all genres. Um, but really I'm thinking more of uh, Sopranos kind of era. Um, well, this should have been a contemporary. I mean, that's the whole thing. You know, what what happened is um, uh, Frank Darabont, who made the season one, six episodes, I think, only, um, wanted to do season two, um, was commissioned to do twice as many episodes for season two, but given half the budget. Um, and then there were, like, ten years of legal wranglings between him and AMC, um, where they sold the rights to distribute the show to themselves for, like, a dollar, which meant that his royalties were, like, 10 cents or something. Oh, that's awful. Right? The money has stiffed this show. That's the thing. The suits killed The Walking Dead. Um, and I always think, what would this show still have been if Frank Darabont had, had, you know, been in the hot seat all the way along instead of the many showrunners it's had, some of whom have been really pretty catastrophic. But yeah, for a time, at the beginning there... Um, it was. It was a contemporary of like, you know, Breaking Bad and Sopranos and shows like that. And, you know, I loved it. I love at least the first five seasons for me, I think were brilliant. I bowed out in um, season four. I don't remember when, but I I do remember. I So I came to it late. I was late to the party. I started watching it um a couple of years after it started airing. So I was able to kind of binge things all at once. And I think, I think season three had, had caused me so much stress <laughs> that by the time I got to season four, I was a bit like, Oh my God, I can't do this anymore. It was, I found the, the whole, um, 
David Morrissey governor. as the governor era extremely distressing. Um, <laughs> well, and just you, the way he kissed Angela. And you guys can make fun of me all you want. Uh, no, it was. It was was distressing. And the thing is, they really humanized him as well. I've been re-watching those seasons, and I, I, I'm quite nostalgia for that time. I think they did a good job with the governor. Like, he becomes a human. He picks up, you know, his friends. I think Fist Bump Tara um, is, you know, introduced at that point, And, you know, it's all quite good. And then he just goes completely insane and just, you know, murders everyone and does a horrible thing to Herschel. Did you get that far? Did you get as far as the final raid on the prison? Yeah, yeah. And then he might have bailed there. Because the what follows from that is a lot of people walking around for quite a long time. Yeah, that sounds about right. A lot of people bailed then because um you started to get episodes without Rick. Um, you got like a couple at the beginning of, of the next season, including the legendary Carl on the roof with a giant tub of pudding. Um, and then there were kind of entire episodes with no Rick and people were like, where are Rick and Carl? And I think a lot of people sort of drifted off there. Not a good time to have drifted because the way that particular strand ends is one of the greatest um, segments of The Walking Dead with Terminus. Really good. It was nice to watch this. I should say also, I did not bother to um, learn about anything that happened (laughs) in the interim. So I basically didn't recognize anyone um, apart from, you know, Daryl and Carol. You're basically like Rick in episode one, aren't you? It's like you've come to you from <laughs> yeah. a coma and all of a sudden there's like weird people in stormtrooper outfits and you haven't got a fucking clue what's going on. Yeah, the stormtrooper outfits were a lot. <laughs> so, but just to say, we're not going to, just like me, you're not going to get filled in with a bunch of extraneous information. We're we're taking this as it comes. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to do my best to not, ask too many questions. Robin's going to take the lead on this one. Oh, yeah. um, he is very much, uh, you know, on our other recaps, I have a longer history with, with the shows that we've watched than, than he does. Um, so the shoe is on the other foot this time, just in time for Thanksgiving. So welcome. We're, we're so grateful for all of you. Oh yeah. Um, we'd be even more grateful mm-hmm. if you head to our Patreon, patreon.com slash bloody day fiance. If you can't find it, um, if you can't find it, it's um, patreon.com slash blighty day. Yeah, but you can also <laughs> no. uh, ask us about it on Instagram and for the time being, Twitter at blighty day fiance. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we must rationalize everything. Some things are blighty day, some things are blighty day fiance. It's, it's a mystery. If one doesn't work, try the other one. One of them is actually bitey day fiance because you forgot to put the L in. <laughs> I know, but that's a special thing that I sell just for the walking dead. Um, <laughs> um, All right, I'm going to try this slightly differently. So when we do our reality whatnot um, malarkey, we don't tend to go beat for beat. That's not really our style. But I think with something like this, it would be fun if we actually just went through it scene by scene. And what I'm looking for from you are your thoughts about, you know, how it was filmed, how it was performed, what the fuck was going on. And by all means, I know you don't want to do too many questions and stuff, but this would be a good time to, to have those chit chats. I can fill in some blanks if you want, right? Sure. Um, okay. So I've done a little recappy little scripty thing and I'm going to read it and I've sort of broken it into chunks. Right? Okay. So we open with. Daryl gets Judith into the hospital, but some Commonwealth stormtroopers bop him right in his magic off switch and pop, he goes straight to sleepy vise. Um, that's a big thing in The Walking Dead. You you only have to sort of touch someone's head and it knocks them out. It's amazing. Very soft heads. It's amazing. Um, luckily, no two people could be knocked out at the same time in this universe, except a few weeks ago with um, Gabriel and Rosita, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, so Judith, uh, as soon as Daryl gets knocked out, Judith wakes up and she locks the door and stops a mm, murder of zombies. What's the collective noun for zombies? Is it like crows? Is it a murder of zombies? That's such a good question. <laughs> I'm I'm sure there is a zumba of zombies. 
I might have to look that up. There might actually be one. Anyway, Judith wakes up long enough to lock the doors and stop them all getting in, right? Okay, uh, there's quite a bit in this first chunk because there's not a lot to talk about. So let me just, I'll, I'll breeze through it. Uh, cut to the outside. Two people you, Michelle, have never met before, Luke and Jules. Uh, she gets very bitten. He gets a little nip in the leg. Uh, then we come back to the hospital. Poor old Lukey, he bleeds out. Um, he has an amputation, uh, doesn't really work, and he fails to play the world's all-time bloodiest harmonica solo. Um, I was really hoping. We'll talk about it. Um, Daryl smacks Judith up with some of the good stuff, which Merle used to sell around the back of the dumpsters in Georgia. Um, apparently, Daryl's blood is enough to get anyone high, and it's enough to bring Judith zinging back to life. <sighs> There's a lot going on in the beginning, wasn't there? Mm-hmm. Pretty frenetic. Yeah. Um, what are your impressions? So that that's like the first bit of Walking Dead that you've seen for years and years and years. And you crash in. Did it remind you of anything? It made me. It, it made me a little sad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> only, I mean, I just need to fill you all in. Look, we don't. Obviously, Thanksgiving is not a is not a British holiday and um and we live in london and we live in london so this that's not surrounding us but you know we're thinking of you and holding your hearts and our hearts etc um i am uh going through some family stuff at the moment so there's you know the passage of time um has a bigger impact on me than perhaps it would were I not in the situation I'm in, but here we are. So my first impression was I was just thinking about when Judith was a baby and when, you know, Carl naming her and stuff. And I was thinking about how Carl and the actor who played him, whose name escapes me, forgive me. um, He was one of the best child actors, I think, there ever has been. He was so natural and so, um, just non precocious. I, Chandler Riggs is is his name. When, um, went on to start like a music career, which I don't believe continued. God bless. Yeah, God bless. So did Beth. She's a good singer. Yeah, I miss Beth too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking about like, wow, this is a Judith is a whole person now. Yeah, little little ass kicker is a bigger ass kicker, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you remember um, Laurie's sort of dying monologue in that episode in the prison? Not really. That still destroys me. Like, I don't think anyone was particularly a fan of her, like, either the character or the actor. (laughs) Let's be honest. Laurie, not an all-time favorite, right? But that monologue, oh, that's tough. You know what? All she did was have sex with someone who, for my money, is (laughs) way, way hotter than Rick. Sorry. Um, Yeah, and I, I think... Can I can I share the contact lens thing with the audience? I don't know what it is, but let's give it a go. Okay, all right. So <laughs> you you will remember it in a bit. So um, our uh, but well, my stepson Robin's son Alfie, not his real name. Um, he's he's allowed to watch some grown up TV as <sighs> yes. long as it's supervised. And, you know, ideally one of us will have seen it before so we can, you know, shield him from the stuff that maybe we don't want him to see. Yeah, heads get averted, pause buttons get pressed, yes. forward wind is always available. Exactly. Um, but there was some there was some stuff going on between uh, Lori and, oh shit, what's, what was his Shane. name? Shane, thank you. Your boy. I can't believe I blocked out his name. Well, I think because... Bernthal. Yeah, I just always think of the actor's name. Anyway, doesn't matter. They were messing around. Use your imagination. Um, sometime later, and this is the, thank God, the only time this has happened, Alfie walked in on Robin and myself in flagrante 
I managed to hide myself under a blanket so he didn't see anything. Um, but I said, you know, he was sort of like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, daddy's contact lens fell out. So I'm trying to help him find it. And then later there was another scene. I mean, I had my glasses on at the time. I don't know if he believed it. There was another scene, (laughs) another love scene. Okay. (laughs) Or lust scene, whatever you might want to call it. I think it might have been love. And Alfie turned and asked, how do you lose a contact lens? <laughs> <laughs> That's when Laurie was helping Shane find his contact lens, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, boy. Um, so, yeah, this show is is very special. Um, he has a little pop-up, does Bernthal, in the closing sort of montage. And we'll yeah, get, it was we'll, nice to see him. Yeah, we'll get to that. What, you missed the episode where Rick died but didn't die, um, which has more... Um, Big Ears action, um, where there are kind of hallucinatory scenes between Rick and Shane. And that was a real joy. I was kind of hoping for some of that. Um, If I'm completely honest, they pulled out the stops more for the episode where Andrew Lincoln leads the show than they did for the end of the show. In that sense. Sure. Um, I thought it was interesting that Daryl's blood. Look, I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how blood transfusions are supposed to work. Um, great to know your blood type. Always, I I don't know mine. I think I'm O negative, but maybe I'm not. Anyway, doesn't matter. No one needs my blood at the present moment in time. Luckily, um, I have. Yeah, it was it was weird to me that he was sort of able to remain standing, standing. for that period of time yeah. while he was yeah. giving. And look, I'm not. I am he has so to, not that person who's like that would never happen in real life. It just it it was yeah. bothering me a little bit. He's got superhuman strength because you know um, we ain't the Walking Dead. Um, I got a lot of time. Perseverance. Um, It reminded me of Lost, where um, Jack did a blood transfusion with someone using a, um, what those spiky sea urchins? Do you remember that? Oh, I could see that. Snapped off, like he needed a needle to do a a blood transfusion, so he snaps off the spine from a sea urchin. It was was like that. Wow. (laughs) Improvised blood transfusions. Um, I wouldn't have put Dr. uh, Daryl Dan as the the doctor type, but it's, it's good to know. It's good to know that Merle had him doing it at a young age. And I, I I appreciated the nod to Merle. I miss Merle. I don't. He was horrible. Yeah. Um, another thing that I thought was odd, uh, the bigger guy with who was chopped into pieces. Um, Luke. Yeah. Professor Luke. I thought for Mu- sure. A musicologist. I thought he was a... And his weapon of choice is a harmonica? No, I don't think that's his weapon. I don't think he kind of uh, boogies the walkers to death. I don't think he's ever done that. Um, There was a thing for a while where he was trying to kind of introduce music back into such civilization as they had, and it was very patronizing and tedious. Then he pissed off to a satellite community called Oceanside, um, where they completely failed to take advantage of the fact that they had amazing natural defenses and everything just consistently went wrong for them. Um, Fell in love with that girl, Jules. But honestly, while all this was happening, no one really gave a fuck. And then came back and disappeared for like years because he he was in those um, Fantastic Beasts movies. Um, And then came back like a couple of episodes ago um, in a big kind of, whoa, my God, it's Luke. Um, But as soon as he came back, I was like, you're dying in the last episode. Because it's like, he was a pink coat, um, pink shirt. You know, like the red shirt thing, like in Star Trek, right? Where so, like the characters in red shirts would always get killed off when they went to the other planet, right? And and it's known in the industry, like red shirts. The, you know. Oh, interesting. Oh, you're not familiar? No. Have you, have you never heard the the term red shirt? Um, I have. I thought it was shorthand for communist. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, 
So yeah, you know, the people that are brought into a show are introduced just to get killed off to oh, sure. artificial okay. drama. So the reason they're called red shirts is because in Star Trek, they would always be the kind of like the the low down kind of squaddies and they'd wear red shirts and Kirk and Spock and McCoy would go down to the planet with like three red shirts and they would always get zapped. That's some good knowledge. Thank you. Um, so yeah, yeah. well, I... I thought that he was a cult leader of <laughs> of some description because it it was just weird to me that a cult leader or a cult leader because he looks a bit like cult a from cult, 90 Day. a cult leader there were a lot of hands on him at all times and they were sort of like sloshing around in his blood and yeah. I thought that was I thought that was a little strange I mean I'm not saying I I try not to think about being in a situation like that or how I would behave or not behave. But I think, you know, um, it just seems like, it seemed like a lot. Well, I think bleeding out when you've had your leg chopped off after being bitten by a zombie probably would be quite a lot. No, I meant not him dying i meant like the sloshing around in his blood and the sort of like all the fanfare and the weeping and yeah it was a lot of that there was a lot of that but it was quite brilliant because it then cut to like carol and daryl who were sort of looking at each other going like get over it it's only luke (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i felt that yeah um what did you make it that was your first introduction to the to um the commonwealth um so we're in the Commonwealth. Um, do you have any feel for what that might be? I'm guessing, and I really am guessing here. I'm guessing because inevitably, um, and I'm very happy to be corrected if this is wrong. I don't think I am, though. Um, invariably, any movie, TV show, book that's about zombies, it's it's an allegory, right? And it's actually talking about consumerism and the failure of capitalism and uh, obsession with wealth and materialism, things of that nature. Right. So I'm guessing the Commonwealth is where um, people of means, shall we say, have pitched up uh, to and protected themselves against uh, the zombie invasion yes um yes and no not just people of means because people of means need people with no means um to do all the shit for them right sure so so it's an entire kind of city state um with satellite outposts around and and they were trying to sort of take over various places one of which was um oceanside that we were referred to um so yeah so you got the you know the big knobs and then you got the the hoi polloi um i guess so you got the full class war stuff and and they teased at so many things and tried to weave it in there was going to be a whole thing where like magna is that her name magma i can never really place it she was working as sort of like in the service industry and was going to sort of you know explore what it was like at the lowest tier of society but they didn't really bother with any of that um generally speaking it was very kind of Crayola politics. Um, you know, the rich are evil and the poor are wonderful. And yeah, fine. But you're right. That is, you know, in the fine tradition of of Day of the um, movies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The dawn of the Wyvern. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. So that checks out. The, and the storm, so the stormtroopers would have been presumably like their territorial army of sorts or the people that they yeah that's exactly right like a cross between the police and the military you know there were i couldn't not think of uh why the last man on earth when we were watching this because it it wasn't dissimilar to that in kind of how things seemed to shake out do we ever get to the end of that? No, we didn't. We we stopped. That kind of got yeah that, tedious too. But that got was, really tedious, didn't it? Um, yeah, but the, I but, love a good Armageddon story. I mean, I'll, I'll go on the record now. Um, 
the greatest TV show of all time, and I will argue the greatest cultural achievement of all time, better than anything by Shakespeare, um, was The Leftovers. And that is an Armageddon tale. Um, I'm a sucker for him. Love him. I loved that show. Or technically a post-Armageddon. Um, yeah. I, well, it was and it wasn't. I think that show... Well, that's... Not why people are listening to this, so I'll just, maybe I'll save it for another time. But, but if 2,000 people join the top tier of our Patreon, we will do an episode-by-episode episode recount of, of The Leftovers. <laughs> oh, I would do that even without <laughs> oh, getting paid for it. Just the episode where Louis Theroux slithers out of the... Justin, the, Justin Theroux. Theroux. Oh my goodness. Justin Theroux slithers out of a bath naked, right? Um, there's a million things yeah. that are on par with that. That show, yeah. people. So that show. I, here's a small detail that bothers me, okay? They don't have... They don't have, to my eyes, a <laughs> large-scale manufacturing setup. No. Even in the Commonwealth, right? It's alluded to. So... Right, but people can always find clothes that fit them, oh, and sure. everybody's shoes are are brand new, and nobody. When when I think about the you number, you didn't even see the ice cream uh, cart. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, there's ice cream carts and stuff, and bakeries, and yeah. Okay, but that's but it's again, like that's Arbor. <laughs> that's food. Like I I get yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But it really annoys me when, like, I think everyone should be dressed the way that Michonne is dressed. Yeah. Right? Like, that checks out to me. That makes sense. But people think about, like, when I think about um, the internet collapsing or there being some kind of large-scale event where, you know, we don't have all of our modern conveniences, right? Uh The biggest... Uh, the thing that I would miss the most immediately is laundry facilities Toilet and paper. being able to have. Well, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> Toilet paper is up, th- which is going to make the laundry facilities even more important. Right. Right. Yeah. It's there's things effect. like that where I'm like, where are people going to the bathroom? Yeah. Where and that's one. Of, that's one of the things that I loved about the show in the beginning was that it was pretty unflinching when it came to, you know. People have bodies and they're giving birth on the floor and yeah. they're, you know, like this is... No, that's right. The clothes were increasingly filthy. Yes, they were. And, you know, you might do with what you can. Um, the Commonwealth seemed to have... Uh, it was hardly explored. There's this guy, Lance Hornsby. Um, he's the zombie that Pamela nearly snogs at the end. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, with the arrow sticking out of his neck. Yep. Um he, um, it seemed to be his job that, to go around and sort of coerce small communities into doing like sweatshop labor for the Commonwealth. So they sort of cover that base, but in a very oblique kind of way. All right. What's next? Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, we cut to a uh, prison cell in the Commonwealth where Princess and Max bust Mercer out of Chokey. Then they meet up with the rest of the gang, including everyone's favorite double hander, Aaron and Lydia. That's a little joke there because they both lost an arm. Um, and they make plans to take down Pamela Milton. Maggie and Negan have another will they, won't they scene. Uh, spoiler the answer is always won't they? Um, I never liked Maggie. I've been pretty vocal about this. Uh, You actually said to me when you were watching it, I don't understand why you love Maggie so much. I have never expressed to you (laughs) any admiration or love for Maggie. You just assumed, because she's got big cheekbones and eyes, that she'd been like my type, right? Yeah, and I don't even... Uh, yes, fine. I'll admit it. Sometimes I say things because I want you to say the opposite of whatever it is I've just said. Yeah, um, she's never done it for me. I I never enjoyed her as a character. I I have nothing against the actress. Um, uh, well, uh, how about Negan? So that 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 was your first glimpse of the legendary Negan. Yes. 
Now, you are because the zeitgeist is the zeitgeist. Even you, a person who doesn't watch the show anymore, just ambiently picked up on the fact that Negan... Is Megan with an N? Oh, <laughs> uh, no. The, what did he oh, do? Oh, because he killed Glenn. Right. Yeah. Oh, I just hit my mic. I do apologize. Um, how do you know that? Um, it's weird, right? That shit just gets around. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, look, it got around. I, I'm very glad that I didn't see that because I loved Glenn. I think most people did. I think he's very... He's a hard character to argue with because he almost always made the right decision. Um, what do you think of Negan at first glance? What do you think of Jeffrey Dean Morgan? I think he's very attractive. He is very attractive. <laughs> he's very much my type. He is, he is swarthy. Yep. He is um, just like you. He is bearded just like you. Yep. Are you seeing a pattern here? Very charismatic. Yep. Yeah, just like me. Um, I mean, I am basically Negan without the baseball bat and leather jacket. Look, I, as regards the chemistry between the two of them, I, I could definitely see it. I thought, well, we'll get to that part when we get to it, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah. Oh. Um, Should we so move? yeah, I get what the fuss is about. Well, that's the thing. So they've they've essentially rehabilitated him over. I mean, there've been a lot of time jumps. We're like ten years or something after the whole Glenn thing by this point. Um, but Rick could have killed Negan and decided that his m mercy would outweigh his wrath <laughs> and let him live. And then you had ten years of people going, probably should have killed him, eh? Um, and and this man trying to kind of, I suppose, rehabilitate himself. It's an interesting thing for a show to cover. Oh my goodness! I to interject, a, a paw just emerged from uh, from the the zombie skull beach that we're on. Um, <laughs> it was adorable, right? Um, Rosita, Eugene, and Gabriel, uh, they find the kidnapped babies, that's good, um, and they rescue Coco from the world's worstly designed playpen. Um, they take off, uh, but they soon find themselves in an echo of, I thought, Rick's tank in the series. I thought that as well. Premiere, um, everyone escapes by scoring up a drain pipe. Um, that was some seriously Batman, the 1960s series, climbing. Uh, <laughs> like... Their feet aren't on any toeholds, but their hands aren't really doing any work. They're just going upwards. No, yeah. and I have decided that at, as uh, a matter of urgency, we both need to work on our core strength. Uh, well, just in case, right? Yep. Uh, and then Rosita shows off the parkour skills we never knew she had. Uh, back at the hospital, the feature zombie uh, shows that he's been to the School of Rock... Do you get that? Ha uh ha. -huh. Because he uses one to break yep, the glass. Got it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then a bunch of yada yardering. Um, and then we're with Eugene finding out that uh, Rosita got nipped during her parkour. Um, he wrestles with asking her for one more peek for all time's sake. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then goes back to Max, who presumably is okay with him seeing her naked. So... Um, I, I liked that little escape scene there and the, the call back to the tank, um, but it made me nostalgic for Glenn. Yeah. What was Glenn, Glenn's line on the, on the radio? Does he call him dickhead? What does he call him? He's like, hey, dickhead, up here or something. What was it? Do you remember? Uh, yeah. Well, no, I don't remember. Oh, it's a beautiful but... line um, and a beautiful moment. And then who's the music by? Is it Cake. I think it might be Cake, the band Cake. You know this can't be you asking questions and expecting <laughs> me to know the answers, because it just won't. But I, the only reason I say it is because you've, you've probably watched it a few times, because I do think that, the, you know, episode one, season one... Oh, yeah, he's going the distance. No, it isn't no. the distance, no. it's a, <laughs> It might not be Cake. Um, but it, it's such an odd choice for a needle drop at the end of that episode, but it's so incredible. And what it does is it's like you have had your mind blown for an hour, there's going to be more of this shit. It's such a, that, that's one of the all time great pilots. Um, and it's I think it's one of the, uh, it, it's in my top five best pilots of yeah. all time. Yeah. 
really and truly. So it was nice. I, I, I felt to have that kind of record, but, um, I do remember like, you know, Rick's peril in the tank felt more perilous. And that was the curse of the show that to be honest, you know, our heroes got ever so good at dealing with zombies, which is right because you can't keep doing the same thing again and again. But when you take that peril away, you're left with the only real peril is man. Yeah. And, ugh, you know, like, can they throw in some sharks or something? <laughs> Cause, That's why, yeah. that is why, and I will declare this early, <laughs> the latest and greatest genre of television ah. is um, repressed homosexuals on a boat and it's the 1890s. Yeah. And and you may it, that may sound glib, but we've now had three of these shows, right? And it they started are off with all brilliant. Season 1 of The Terror. Yep. Absolutely outstanding. Brilliant. Yep. North Water, even better. Yep. 1899. Don't know yet. We've watched two episodes, but it's in the sweaty naked men on a boat genre. Oof. And we're here Love for it. Love it. We are here for it. Love it. I just want to see Colin Farrell climb inside a polar bear and then I'll be happy. I don't need him to climb inside a polar bear. <laughs> hey now, hey now. I'm very happy with the amount of weight that he put on for that performance. Yeah, I right. thought he was super hot. And you know what? I liked uh, Adam Sandler in Uncut Gems too. I like that belly. <laughs> Good. I will continue eating pies. Um, so. No, it's different for you. All right. All right. Um, what are we... All right, let's do the variant zombies. Um, I said before, it's uh, variant ex machina. They kind of dropped it in at the last minute. The reason they're doing it, and this is probably the time to talk about this, the reason they've done variants is um, not to make this last season spicier, but for spin-offs. Okay, that's still dumb, though. AMC, being the dumbest network on American and international television, um, decided that it would announce all of the spin-offs before the end of this show, in much the same way that they announced Rick's departure before he departed, because God forbid anything should ever come as a surprise when he can get advertisers to pay a little bit more money for individual episodes. So we already know supposedly, unless, you know, I'm behind on the news on this, but um, Negan and Maggie are off to New York. Isle of the Dead, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, Daryl and Carol were due to go on their own adventures, um, but then, uh, what's her name? Uh, it's not Melissa McCarthy. I always get it wrong. What, what's the actor's name? Oh, I don't know. Oh, no. Sorry. All right. You're all yelling at your headphones, but that's fine. I won't look it up. Um, Carol um, decided that she didn't want to bugger off to Europe and leave her family or whatever for a period of time. So it's just the Daryl show. Um, and that's going to be set in France. I hope it's going to be filmed in France. Uh, some of it probably will. And the rest of it will probably be filmed in... Romania. <laughs> yeah. Almost certainly. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Canada or maybe Atlanta. I mean, you know, hey... They got roots there. Um, Daryl's got a little restaurant uh, with Greg Nicotero, who does all the special effects, and I think directed this last episode. He directs most of the big episodes these days. Um, the coldest I have ever been in my life. Atlanta. Not no, not yeah. Atlanta. Eastern Europe. I went ah. to a film studio about an hour outside of Budapest, where they had filmed a couple of different. Um, they filmed the Borgias there, that show that no one watched. Um, and they had done a couple of different films, but it was sort of like the the Hollywood of Eastern Europe, you know, like, or the Universal Studios. Like, there's a massive back lot, and yeah, you can, yeah. like, go and... So, yeah, I went when it was, when it was, like, minus 20 <laughs> or something like that. Brutal. It was so cold yeah. that if you spit it would like turn yep. to ice yep. um but it was fun well maybe that's why carol doesn't want to go that's probably why she doesn't want to go i <laughs> look i don't blame her but also 
you know, you can do some great, anyway, yeah. whatever. Next bit. So that's, well, I just want to say, so that's, that's, I think the variance will set the tone for the spinoffs, right? Because otherwise, it's just like a sixth of the show, right? If you just have one character, and we we've already had like Morgan sort of buggering off to fear and stuff, and we've seen what happens when you take a character and try and put them in another show. It's not necessarily good, so they have to be different shows. And I think their way of trying to make it different is by sort of doing rage zombies a bit, right? I believe they might even go fast in France too. <laughs> Um, and you know what? I'm probably okay with it because I don't want any more of this. You know what, though? Great thing about French zombies, they smoke <laughs> indoors. You can, you can smoke inside. They don't mind. Yeah. They don't give you any shit for it. Yeah. Instead of wearing, like, um, what other Walking Dead podcasters have called, like, gormaflage or um, stench suits or whatever, you know, um, they kind of rub themselves in zombie guts so they can walk among them. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they ever did that in the time you were watching the show. You might have seen Aaron doing it in this episode, the guy with the thing attached yeah. as well. Um, um, instead of that in France, do you think Daryl will have to sort of cover himself with, like, camembert? No, he won't have to cover himself at all because people there already stink. <laughs> oh shit! I'm sorry. These are you know I, what? No. I'm. No. You know what? We've never had a single review from Apple Podcasts in France. I think it's fine. <laughs> I look. I am. I think it's fine. I'm, Playing on it's a, just a joke. ridiculous stereotype just for the joke. record, because people came for us over our jokes about Scotland. I love France. Um, it's no, a beautiful country, love and we, we love, love going there. So th- I'm, yeah, it's a. And we hope you enjoy Daryl Dixon. Yes, very much. Um, right. Um, I will cover, because that was quite a big chunk, and I'm aware of it, um, Eugene and Rosita. Um, That, I guess they wanted that to be the emotional core of this episode. They were like, who can we kill off that we haven't announced is already going to be in a spin-off? You know, I didn't say that there would be any spoilers for this stuff at the beginning, but fuck it. If AMC are spoiling everything, then so am I. So I guess they were thinking, well, like, you know, there should be a death in the final episode. Who should it be? There's not really anyone. Uh, there was the threat of Eugene all season being executed for crimes against the Commonwealth, so it would be dumb if it was him. Can't be Carol, because she was going to be in this spinoff. Can't be Daryl. Can't be uh, Judith. Can't be, you know, they sort of run out of people, really. Could have been Jerry, but that would have really pissed people off. No one would have cared about Ezekiel, particularly. And they went for Rosita. And I don't know, dude. It just feels mean. <laughs> like, Rosita's hardly been in the show since the peak of, like, Negan being ag- aggressive in Alexandria. I remember, like, the scene with, like, the mattress and stuff. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. Um, that was probably the last time Rosita mattered. And they just they do this at the end. It just seemed really mean, but you don't even know who these people are, do you? Nope. No clue. (laughs) Um, When people are fleeing the prison, let me get this right. No, you really don't have to do this. Let's just move on to the next section. (laughs) Fine. But she was a core cast member for many, 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 many years. Um, And Eugene kind of came along at that time as well. His thing is he he talks in a kind of nerdy, overdone, over blown way, which was played down in this episode, so you probably didn't really get the point of him. But did you like his party in the back? Uh, wasn't crazy about his party in the back. Um, just cause it, it's giving Steven Seagal who I've got no time for. Um, it really was. I, I should explain the reference I did before w- when these characters were first introduced, um, Rosita was with a guy called Abraham and Eugene, who was kind of like, um, like an incel, uh huh. Um, would they would tolerate Eugene watching them fuck? What? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it's kind of weird. I thought for Eugene to be the one 
to usher Rosie Turns in the next life in this way, really, when their history was that he would basically sort of perv on her. Ew. And they kind of knew it. I think. Wait, are we talking like he's in the room with popcorn or like he's outside in a plinth? I wish I remembered. I think there might have been like a peephole in the wall. Okay. But I think it was a known peephole. That's still weird. Yeah, it's really I mean, weird. I'm not, look, people can live their lives and do whatever they oh, yeah, like yeah. to consenting adults, but he was, I thought... I thought you were going to say that she was like uh, his child bride or something, or she was no. coerced into some kind of relation. Because that's what it felt like when they were talking to each <laughs> yeah, other. Yeah, I know. It was weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also looks like somebody who is constantly sweating. Yes. Like- uh, Even outside of the zombie ha- apocalypse. Has, yes, yeah. arm rings of armpit sweat. And I say this as somebody who's a, look, I'm a sweaty- You know what? They film this stuff in Georgia. I think in the summer. Like that. Yeah. Um, now I get it. The actor is actually a comedian. Um, and look, he, he's, he's a very nice man, very talented. But um, yeah, it's a funny one that. Um, Abraham, who she was with, um, was the other guy who got his brains bashed out when Glenn died. Uh, Negan actually did two people that day, but no one remembers poor old Abe. Yikes. Yikes. Right. Let's continue. Um, somehow, God only knows how. Um, and I will go back and watch this and see if I missed anything. We're just in the estates now, um, which is the fancy dancy gator community in the Commonwealth. Yeah. They were outside, suddenly they're inside. And there's a whole load of fuss about all of these people trying to get in, right? Um, but our guys just get in <laughs> because Mercer knows someone, but it's never shown. Um, Mercer, by the way, is the guy... The, the guy in red? Yeah, he's the Halloween stormtrooper. Okay, the, yeah. The pumpkin stormtrooper. Right. Um, who is like the head soldier guy. Um, so somehow they're in. And this is just... This is what The Walking Dead has become. Again, it's a little bit like final season Game of Thrones where they were jetpacking all over the place. And it's like, well, how do they get there in that amount of... Like, they've run out of time. They've run out of budget. It just is, okay? Live with it. Ba- it's bad TV when that happens, but you just you have to accept it with this show. There are going to be times when things just happen. You have to accept it. They haven't accounted for it. And actually, you can sit there and think, if I were the writer, I'd have done this and this and this, because that would have made sense. But I really think that they get writers who are like between shifts at Wendy's, um, and they don't have long because the fries need cooking. So... It's sad. It's sad. Um, but we're back in the estates, um, and Pamela is ordering her goons to keep the proles out. Our heroes realize that George Orr is better than War War, and Daryl channels Rick, uh, Rick and um, and the titular line, um, and he makes one of those speeches that Rick used to do, and he changes the hearts and minds of every stormtrooper present. Um, with that, Pamela's number is up. So she considers tongue kissing a zombie Lance, but Maggie denies her that quick exit, uh, while Judith tries to pick up the vies by telling her it's never too late. Did you think that for a big denouement, like, I guess this has been like the governor, I mean, it is a governor, it's Governor Milton, um, but it's a little bit like the governor, governor, like, for the end of a big arc like that, did you think this was a good showdown? No, not really. It was it was pretty anticlimactic. And the one thing I will say about Daryl and Carol, God bless, is that they both looked so fucking over it the whole time. <laughs> they were the actors, you mean, or the characters? Just the characters. Just yeah, everything. Well, the characters are dealt with so much- done with it they dealt with so much bigger shit than fucking pamela mills and you know it's, yeah it's nothing like like the claimers were much scarier the wolves were much scarier because they were feral like some of these groups that we've met negan was significantly because he had like a, a genuine philosophy behind what he did and it was, but this is just you know a woman in a chanel knockoff it's there's nothing scary about her at all well you say that yeah i suppose that's the point isn't it the yeah. true evil all right um Okay, freedom's won, yay. Um, it's time to take back the Commonwealth uh, from the herd. So the 
gang rig up a record player. Um, Cult of Personality by Living Colour. It was Living Colour. Okay. Do you remember Living Colour? I do not. Uh, they were a rock band and... I mean, it's, it feels really weird saying this, um, but, you know, they were notable because, you know, they were not white. I think at least one of them wasn't. I think they were I think they were all Af- African-Americans. Um, and that was kind of a strange thing back in the day, right? Because rock was really white. Is that fair to say? I think cock, it's fair to say. Cock rock, yeah. That yeah, yeah. sort of hair hair band era, yeah. Yeah, they were like a more commercial kind of faith no more, maybe funk rock metal kind of thing um but that was one of their hits um and um yeah so they got the record player they got cult of personality and then they got rumstein's entire collection of pirate techniques and they blow the her to kingdom come back at the estate which felt incredibly easy what did you think of that for a bit of macgyvering um look i don't begrudge them that <laughs> uh Alfie asked me yesterday, I don't even remember what the question was. He asked me something, I said something back, and he said, if that happens, I'm going to turn into a pyromaniac. Wow. And I said, do you know what a pyromaniac is? And he went, no. No, he was just arson about. (laughs) (laughs) Quite. It's not Um, Friday, it's not Dad Joe Friday. No, it isn't. But the thing that I will miss the most about The Walking Dead is... Uh, Rick's dad joke memes because that was <laughs> sublime. I loved those. Yeah. Oh. Um. They the explosion. They spent some money. Um. I think that's all the money for the last seven seasons. I guess I didn't mind that explosion. It was it was all right. I mean, it was cartoony and a bit eye zombie, but you know it's fine. Um. But it reminded me of the the Lake of Fire in Alexandria, if any of y'all remember that. Um, but I felt that that felt grittier and realer, and this was just, you know, cartoon stuff. It, it maybe reminded me of the aeroplane landing or blowing up in fear, and, uh, you know, just, yeah, fine, okay. They, it was a nothing threat that was dealt with in a nothing way, so fine. Um Milton tells Carol and Daryl that governing is hard work, but they remember how easy it was to create a stable democracy when they moved to Alexandria so they don't listen to her. Um, Yeah, these are not actually the people that you want running anything. They're terrible at it, but fine. Good luck to them all. Yep. I think he's freaking out about his shadow. (laughs) The bulldog. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sweetie pie. Oh, bless you. Come here, Shmoo. Okay, out on the stoop. Um, this is a big scene. Out on the stoop, Maggie tells Negan uh, she will never forgive him. And for the first time in living memory, Negan keeps his mouth well and truly shut. Yeah, look, forgiveness isn't for the other person. It's for you. So, you know, if you want to hold on to that, that's great. You're not doing anything to... It's not doing anything for Glenn's memory to hang on to that. It's not doing anything for your kid to hang on to that. It it's not it's not helping anybody. You're not forgiving him. And plus we all know the two of you are gonna get up to something somewhere down the line. So what I will say is I thought never look a dick horse in the mouth. Right. Um you just got those fringe zombies and then Jeffrey Dean Morgan. I mean, which you going to choose, right? <laughs> um, what I will say is I actually thought that this was a rare moment of quite sophisticated writing. So everything that you said is right. What I liked about this is that Maggie acknowledges that, right? She says all of that. Like, holding on to this is not what I want. It's shit. It will get me nowhere. But I just can't. And I actually thought that was, like, there were levels of writing there, right? That wasn't the immediate reaction. It's the, I decided I was never going to try and forgive you. And I actually tried to forgive you. Turns out I cannot forgive you. Like, whenever I look at you, it's still there and there's nothing I can do about it. I thought that was quite sophisticated writing for this show. Agree? 
Uh, disagree. Okay. But you know what? That's fine. There was a bit of nuance, I thought. Um, all right. Back in the, uh, the house that they're now in, um, everyone's having a lovely party, uh, listening to Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. Um, but there's always one person who's determined to ruin the party. And this time it's Rosita who leaves early and hands off all the childcare to Gabriel. Boo. Um, I'm being glib. I found it, honestly, hard to care. Yeah, you don't care because you don't know who Rosita is, right? Nope. Didn't make a difference. Didn't make a difference. She has it. Her, that baby was cute. Yeah, Coco. Um, so she's dead. Uh, Coco's dad, Sadiq, died uh, around the time Carl died. Um, Abraham, who was her boyfriend, he's dead. Coco's sort of been all around the houses now. Um, I guess it's Gabriel and maybe a bit of Eugene. But you know what? One thing that I like about this post-apocalyptic society is that the children yeah, yeah. are raised by the the village, by the community, right? Right. And I think that's how it should be. You know, you share in the burden, you share in the... In the joy. In the joy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, they love a time jump on The Walking Dead, and we fast forward a year because that's much easier than what... Um, George R. R. Martin, when he um, said to write in Game of Thrones, was kind of like, yeah, Tolkien's all well and good, but like, what do they do about the taxes after all of that? Um, I want to write something which actually reflects how this shit really would go down. Uh, Walking Dead never really played that game when they have like hard questions like, how do you actually set up a society? Which would have been really fascinating stuff to cover in the zombie apocalypse, right? Sure. They just go, time jump is all fine. They did try it once um, back in Alexandria um, and they're not very good at that stuff. Um, so I'm probably glad that they time jumped. Um, everything's lovely now. As equally, um, Mercer are running the show. Eugene's got little baby Rosie with Max. Um, Negan's secret Santa's Judith with uh, re-gifting her something she gave him years ago, <laughs> uh, which I thought was quite rude. Um, that was the the compass. Um, I think there's a note with it. I, I imagine we might see that note again. So, this is the whole thing. It's like, it didn't feel like a, it's not, honestly, it's not a, a serious finale because all of these things are going to mean something because the show's not over. It will just have a different name. Um, everyone has a bit of a chit chat about what's next. Maggie feels that there's adventure on the horizon. Daryl makes plan to head off on new adventures. He has a little moment with Carol. Um, she says, you know, I'm allowed to be sad. Um, you're my best friend. That's nice. I remember back to incredible scenes between Carol and Daryl, like when she found him reading the book about um, surviving child abuse did you get that far um Do you remember that i'm not sure if i did but theirs was my favorite relationship my favorite friendship the most interesting and i i love carol and i when i think about i get really emotional uh about her actually because to me melissa mcbride yes to me um she was so she was such a phenomenal character uh who was so well written mm -hmm. and kind of more than way more than you would expect oh, right yeah. without a doubt like when you think about the things that she went through in her life and the and the journey that she went on from the very beginning of having you know been a mother to this young child Sophia her you know leaving her abusive marriage and and proving to sorry now i'm getting really emotional but like right. proving to herself that she had what it took to survive and really like and i that she had value and she could fit in and that yes. she was smarter than yes. everyone else and i felt every minute mm -hmm. of her grief for sophia that was mm -hmm. so for a show that can sometimes verge on ridiculous that that subplot was so beautifully realized, you know, and right. that was, that's what I miss so terribly about the earlier days was you had these fundamental kind of things that are very true about grief, right? Mm -hmm. The magical thinking 
that you have in times of trauma and in times of grief of like, yeah, maybe these are people that we can rehabilitate. It's like, no, they're not. They're dead. And that's not your daughter anymore. And it never will be, right? Which is explored even more um, with Carol just after you bailed, actually, with an incredible... I mean, if I say look at the flowers, people will know what I'm talking about. But yeah, Carol has many more of those moments um, throughout the show and, and remains, you know, her heyday, her high point is shortly after that and then the beginning of discovering the kingdom, her relationship with the Zika. I mean, like, that, it, it went wrong for me, like, one or two seasons ago, the whole cave thing and everything where they tried to bring Carol into other people's storylines and I don't think they really knew what to do with her and the low point was probably that like the bonus covid episode with her and the rat um but yeah um she's incredible she's incredible i'm sure we'll see her again i'm sure um it's star wars right the the franchise is going nowhere um and i'm sure we'll see her again um it was interesting for me though that daryl got out of the walking dead without losing his virginity um which Although it sounds like I'm being glib, I'm really not. That was a huge thing about Daryl for so long. Is he gay? Is he straight? Is he asexual? Is he sexually traumatized? Um, no one ever knew. Um, Maybe it doesn't matter. That's the whole thing. Uh, there was Connie. He didn't really seem too upset about leaving her. Um, she was the one signing. Um so, yeah, I was kind of impressed that they never wrote a love interest for him. Never did it. Always managed to get out of that. So, I was quite impressed. But he did abandon his dog. Not abandon, just parked for a bit. But Judy said, I'll keep an eye on dog. That's no good. You don't just keep an eye on. Let's not, this is going to upset me, so let's not talk about it. All right. That's the end of The Walking Dead, um, sort of. We now have... Um, the <laughs> epilogue yeah you, you know when you order out for food um <laughs> like in this country like you uh, we have to like deliver in america like postmates and uber eats i guess are the two big ones is that right I, maybe it's I been think a while it's regional you. Yeah. yeah um but you, i i don't know if it's the same in the states over here you might get like a little freebie so you might get like a can of energy drink or something with the food that you ordered we got pasta yeah, we for got, some reason. Like, a packet of pea pasta is weird. Which is great because we're gluten-free. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the little bonus thing that comes sort of taped to the side of your carry-out bag. Um, and that's what this was. It was um, some um, postmodern beat poetry <laughs> uh, read by Denai Guerrero and Andrew Lincoln um, weaving into each other's lines um, as they wrote... Uh, letters, I guess, to each other and to Judith, I think, and then, you know, sort of left them around in case anyone should find them. That sounds ridiculous, but uh, that's happened in The Walking Dead before. Um, it happened with Matey Boy with the scar on his face, whose name I've forgotten, and his wife, who was Negan's wife. This felt to me very much like um, a senior, like high school seniors yeah. farewell. Yeah project mm -hmm. um it was it was saccharine it was <laughs> hollow it, it had it was overshot to shit yeah wasn't yeah it, it like, really so, was so saturated and yeah stylized yeah yeah um but Very yeah cartoony. it's it also but it but seeing those old faces yeah, um, I, I tried to take down who we saw. Um, we got Carl, Laurie, Shane, Dale. I love Dale. T-Dog. T-Dog, Glenn, Abraham, Andrea, Bob, Stuckey, um, Sadiq, Jesus. There was a guy called Jesus. Um, it wasn't his real name. He just looked like Jesus. Um, Herschel, Beth, Tyrese, Sasha, Tara, Edith, Aiden, Deanna. I got really... No governor. I was so annoyed that they killed off Dale because I was like, that's a hate crime. Did he, he, was was the only, crime. he was the only Jewish character <laughs> God, in, yeah. the, in, the scheme, in the entire scheme of things. Do we know that Dale was Jewish? I'm pretty sure he was Jewish. He was nebbish. 
He read very Jewish to me. Okay. Yeah, you're right. He had a kind <laughs> of um oh, mate. What what's uh, matey boy's name out of Homeland? Saul. Yeah, what's the yeah, actor? Mandy Patinkin. He, he had a bit of him. Yeah, he, he did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Rick and Michonne then recite all of the word arc in Darcy Silver's house. <laughs> yeah, they sure did. We together are the strongest thing. We are love, and love is endless. We are endless. <laughs> it's just there's a lot of word art. A lot of word art. <sighs> Uh, we then cut to Michonne wearing her Marvel costume from Black Panther. Um, they didn't want to buy a costume, I think. She's looking for Rick. He's looking for her. Um, sadly, he's um, at the worst red flag beach in the world. Um, and he gets picked up by a CRM hole, uh, helicopter again. Um, so essentially, we haven't learned anything since he disappeared, really. But we know that she's out there. We know that he's out there. They're looking for each other. Daryl's looking for them. Um, and that's that. Then we get one little final montage where everyone says, we're the ones who live. I have a question. Yeah. I, d- I will say also, if you've done, um, and in a past life, I did many, many, many of these. If you've ever done like a corporate, video or promo this is exactly what they ask for and expect every time and no matter every person says that we love our characters we our customers we love our customers yeah we are we are the ones who live that is that is the most and and you'll tell them we are the ones who give great customer service yep and you'll tell them uh that's gonna ring really hollow when (laughs) um you know you're changing your policy so that your employees no longer get maternity leave like <laughs> d- you can you can do all of that and they will demand this you know early w- yeah. what was the ad agency that apple worked with I don't know. I've well, they, but they did stuff like that, right? It's like it's about changing the future. Yeah. It's very, you know, like late '90s Silicon yep. Valley kind yep, of yep, yep. talk. It's jargony. Now, what I will say, and it was, it was obvious, but it wasn't there because it was buried under mountains of like corn syrup. But I think the idea and what Rick is saying there is that. We collectively are one life and people will come and go, but life continues and, and and we are literally one, like one organism of humanity and like a hydra, if you chop off one head, another will grow back. There's some of that in there. I mean, it was almost like they're trying to write like a philosophy in there and it didn't work, but you know, hey. Okay. Ultimately, if you're finishing something this big, and make no mistake, this was the biggest show on American TV for a substantial period of time. Um, I guess you have to finish it with an idea, do you? Probably. I don't know what they thought they were going for. And like I say, it felt like Darcy word up, but I don't know, man. I'll be honest with you. I do not think they shat the bed. I thought it was fine, and I really haven't enjoyed the show for the last few years, Um, but I thought it was fine. I'm not sure I could have done a whole lot better. I would like to um, conclude with a quote (laughs) by Joan Didion, if that's all right with you. Season three, right? (laughs) We are imperfect mortal beings, aware of that mortality even as we push it away, failed by our very complication, so wired that when we mourn our losses, we also mourn, for better or for worse, ourselves, as we were, as we are no longer, as we will one day not be at all. Rest in peace, the walking dead. And we will see see you you soon. soon.